Children's uh, technical speaker, uh, Dr. Thankful Cromerty. Um, and uh, I guess I always get in trouble when I do off the cuff remarks about people. So I'm going to take a risk here. If she um, decides she doesn't like some of the things I'm saying um, and she drops offline, I'll owe all of you an apology and I will owe her even more, I'm certain. Um, I, uh, we have up on the screen her full official, or not her full official bio, but a, a synopsis of uh, some of the wonderful things she's been doing and places she's been. But uh, a little bit about her personally. Um, I, I am from North Carolina, and so is uh, Charles Osborne, one of her online hosts. Um, we noticed that uh, Dr. Cromerty got her BS in physics with highest honors from University of North Carolina. And um, Charles and I felt very sorry for her that she was not able to attend the premier college in North Carolina, the University of, uh, I'm sorry, North Carolina State University in Raleigh, where both <laughs> Charles and I <laughs> attended. Um, but UNC, I suppose, has a good reputation in some departments. Um, uh, she received her PhD uh, from the University of, Phys of uh, uh, Virginia. Um, very, very interesting work she did there. Um, uh, following that, she did postdoctoral research um, uh, on the NASA Einstein Fellowship uh, at Cornell. But even previous to that, she was the um, uh, NRAO uh, Grote Reber uh, Doctoral Fellow and much of her research was done here at Green Bank. So um, uh, she is currently, uh, as I'd mentioned, she is currently at Cornell. And it was very fortuitous, I believe, that Dr. Jackson this morning, the uh, director here at uh, Green Bank, uh, mentioned the research she was doing uh, in nanohertz uh, gravitational waves. Uh, he gave, uh, as far as I could imagine, he gave the best possible intro to the um, talk that we've asked Dr. Cromerty to give us, uh, because he, he really laid the groundwork for why all that is very important, why it is relevant to the larger study of physics, and um, sort of opened the door uh, for our understanding as to um, how this is truly one of the great frontiers of radio astronomy. So with that, uh, Dr. Cromedy, thanks for your time today and over to you. I will stop screen sharing and you'll have full control. Thank you so much. Let me get my, get my screen sharing under control first. How does that look? It looks very good. Okay, great. And I appreciate the introduction. It's always nice to meet uh, fellow North Carolinians, despite our deeply rooted sorts of fun rivalries. <laughs> um, and I hope I don't repeat too much of what Jim already said this morning. Um, but yeah, today I just want to talk to you about what Nanograv has been up to, along with the International Pulsar Timing Array, uh, so we can go ahead and get started. Okay. So we're just going to start with a very brief introduction to pulsar timing arrays. And so when masses move through space, when they accelerate through space, they create ripples in space time, and we call those gravitational waves. And a little bit in the same way that different frequencies of electromagnetic radiation, uh, you know, obviously from one end of the spectrum to the other, you can see different phenomena going on astrophysically, right? And that can tell you a lot about different processes at play at whatever objects you're looking at. And gravitational waves, it turns out, um, span sort of a similar order of magnitude and also uh, help you probe different kinds of astrophysical processes. And so here you see uh, gravitational wave frequencies on the x-axis and all of the different kinds of experiments that are going on. And so, you know, after the GR prediction of, of gravitational waves, um, about 100 years ago by Einstein, there was obviously the first direct detection of gravitational waves by LIGO, which was an extraordinarily exciting discovery. Um, but that was at the relatively high frequency end of the spectrum. Um, in the middle, uh, you have 
experiments like LISA, which is planned to launch next decade, um, they're going to be sensitive to events like uh, mass in spirals of, of kind of middle mass black holes and things like that, uh, where there are large differences in the mass of the two objects. LIGO was sensitive to, um, you know, some neutron stars maybe, or definitely, but some neutron stars and some lighter black holes. Um, but then what I'm going to be talking about today is at the very low gravitational wave frequency end of things. And so this is why it's in the nanohertz regime. Um, this is where pulsar timing arrays live. And so pulsar timing arrays, I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. But our goal, our, our first goal, is to detect a stochastic background of gravitational waves from a totally different kind of source class, which is supermassive binary black hole mergers. Um, so not right kind of at the moment of merging in the same way that an experiment like LIGO is sensitive to for much lighter black holes, but the in spiral process. And so these are much lower wave or much longer wavelength uh, events, um, but they're also quite strong. They're, they're events that deform space time quite a lot. OK, so pulsar timing array, basically, you know, instead of being Earth based in the way that an experiment like LIGO is, where you have sort of a, an interferometer that's based on the Earth and sort of at Earth length scales, um, like on the order of kilometers. PTAs, pulsar timing arrays, are on galactic scales. So they are basically galactic scale interferometers, which is pretty amazing. Um, so our test masses are a bunch of millisecond pulsars, which I'll talk about in a minute, that are scattered all around the sky, um, you know, sort of in our local area of the Milky Way. You can see the little square on the uh, bottom left um, showing kind of characteristic distances between pulsars and the Earth. Um, but the idea is that this stochastic background of gravitational waves that's created by all of the supermassive binary black hole mergers going on all over the universe is going to have a very characteristic pattern. And that will show up in our observations with radio telescopes of these millisecond pulsars. And so if we see little changes in the pulsars that are spatially correlated, uh, in this way that's predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity, then we will have a sense that the signal we're seeing, which has a very characteristic shape, is from a background of gravitational waves. Okay, so I already mentioned the first goal of these experiments is to detect that stochastic background, that sort of ensemble signal. Um, the time of arrival uh, that you see me reference here, so I, I say that the deviations, the little changes that you want to correlate between all your pulsars are changes in the time of arrival. And that's because pulsars basically act as space clocks. Um, I'll talk about them more in a minute. But we're looking for tiny, tiny changes in the ticking of our clocks. And we need to make sure that those changes are correlated uh, in this very specific quadrupolar way. And we call that curve uh, that shows the correlations as a function of angle between pulsars. Uh, this is the Hellings and Downs curve. So our detector is the size of the galaxy. It's made of pulsars, but we use radio telescopes to look at our pulsars. And so it's sort of a funny uh, distinction, but an important one to make. OK, so why do we want to do this in the first place? Um, we know that the very far away, very young galaxies are tiny, they're irregular. Um, but we also know that older galaxies are very large and have this kind of beautiful structure like what you see on the left. Um, and so we want to know how this actually happens. It's a really hard phenomenon to study uh, because, you know, we don't see it happen over our lifetimes, right? So we just see snapshots. And this is a really interesting kind of novel way to study the growth of galaxies. We want to know about the mass distribution of these supermassive black hole binaries. We know, want to know about uh, how often they're merging, how massive they are, uh, how they proceed, how the mergers even happen. Um, and a ton of other things. So there are lots of interesting astrophysical implications uh, for doing these experiments as well. Um, you can go beyond just detections of that stochastic gravitational wave background that I mentioned. Um, eventually, pulsar timing array experiments uh, expect to gain sensitivity to what are called continuous wave sources. So these are individual binary supermassive black hole mergers going on that we'll be able to identify. 
Um, there are also some exotic uh, events, things that kind of permanently deform space-time, like bursts with memory that technically shows up in our frequency band. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, exotic stuff like cosmic strings and inflation. Um, but all of these things have slightly different requirements for our radio observations. And so you can kind of gain sensitivity to different phenomena by planning your observing program in a different way. Okay, so millisecond pulsars and pulsar timing. This is really what my research focuses on for the most part. I'm uh, currently chair of Nanograv's timing working group. And so I am gonna talk about a lot of our results, uh, but some of them are a bit outside of my range of expertise. I'll give you that warning now, uh, but the pulsar stuff is sort of my, my deal. Um, so millisecond pulsars are a very special class of pulsar, which is a neutron star that's rapidly rotating and has a very strong magnetic field. It beams radiation out of its magnetic axes, and as it does that, it's also spinning, right? And so every time that beam from its axis crosses our line of sight, we see that as a pulse. It's very much like a lighthouse. And so pulsars give off these, you know, very distinct, very regular signals that we see as pulsations. Um, normal pulsars have rotation periods on the order of seconds, uh, but these millisecond pulsars have millisecond rotational rates, which is just pretty unfathomable, unfathomable to be totally honest. It, it's really hard to imagine something more than the mass of the sun uh, compacted into the size of a city spinning as fast as a blender. I mean, I try to wrap your head around it. I certainly can't. Um, somewhat unintuitively, millisecond pulsars, the, the very fast spinning ones, are actually an older part of the population because the way they got spun up to those extremely, extremely fast speeds was by accreting a bunch of matter from a companion. And so often the evolutionary process goes through and you're left with a millisecond pulsar and a white dwarf companion. And so in an experiment like Nanograv and most pulsar timing array experiments, we're looking at a lot of pulsars uh, that are very fast, very stably rotating millisecond pulsars in orbit with a white dwarf companion. Uh, MSPs do have a relatively weak magnetic field compared to normal MSPs. That just has to do with some shielding that happens during that recycling process, the accretion process. We know of more than 400 millisecond pulsars now, and I think something like 4,000 normal pulsars. So it's a relatively small proportion of the population. Um, and Pulsars are really traditionally thought of as radio objects. So most of our observations happen in the few hundred megahertz to a few gigahertz range. Uh, for nanograv specifically, we're doing most of our observations at 820 megahertz and L band. Um, so even for radio, you know, a relatively low frequency part of the spectrum. Um, obviously, there's lots of exciting work going down to even lower frequencies and also at the extremely high end of things. So at the, you know, X-ray and gamma rays, pulsars don't emit a ton in the middle, in the sort of visible area of the spectrum, um, but they really are thought of as radio objects. Okay, so pulsar timing is what nanograv actually uses. This sort of describes what we're trying to do with our observations of the pulsars. And this is the process of creating a model that can account for each and every pulse from a millisecond pulsar over very long periods of time. So being able to number, you know, this is pulse one, two, three, four, going way far into the future, um, which is very interesting. It's extremely cool that we can even do this. Um, but unfortunately, it's not as simple as just saying, well, here's the period of this pulsar, here's its position, let's just create a model that you know, goes and predicts each time of arrival. There are things, as you can see in this diagram on the right, you know, if there was nothing else intervening, you'd have this very nice, very regular signal. You wouldn't have to worry about it. Um, and it would be very easy to create these models. But that's not what's actually going on. So lots of things are happening uh, between the pulsar and us and at the pulsar, like if it's in a binary, uh, we have to contend with the interstellar medium that's uh, along the line of sight between us and the pulsar. Um, we have to account for general relativistic effects, all kinds of interesting things. Um, and so the process of doing this pulsar timing is actually quite complicated. Um, I also include on the left an example of a pulse profile. And so the thing on the top is the, the profile of the pulsar that's been folded, it's been integrated many, many times, right? Because if it's a millisecond pulsar, it's pulsing very, very frequently. 
And so you're building up thousands of pulses, all of which look a little bit different. You know, there's some intrinsic jitter and everything, but you're folding them up at the known pulse period. And that, that profile that you get, kind of what the pulse looks like, is going to be a very stable signal over long periods of time. Usually, we've seen some exceptions, uh, but for the pulsars that we use for pulsar timing rate work, uh, generally speaking, their pulse profiles are quite stable. And so this is sort of, if you want to get kind of a picture of what the pulsar looks like, I guess this is about as close as you can get. Okay, so there are a bunch of things that can affect the time of arrival of the pulses. Obviously, the most basic are things like how fast it's spinning and how fast its orbit is or its spin is decaying. Um, if it's in a binary, you have to account for the Keplerian motion of the binary. Um, there's dispersion from the interstellar medium, general relativistic effects, as I mentioned. Um, and all of these things, you have to add terms to your timing model to get proper pulsar timing uh, with good predictive power. So we call the difference between a measured time of arrival and what the model predicted a timing residual. You can see on the left-hand side so if you have a good timing solution that's accounting for the time of arrival properly, you know, all these different factors are taken into account, you're going to see your residuals kind of have a nice scatter around zero. But if there's something missing, and this, these examples are like extreme, right, because we would never want to see that kind of structure in our timing residuals. But if you do see that structure, you know that there's something really wrong missing. And so if you have your spin down rate uh, wrong by 1%, you see that growing exponential structure. Um, and then you can see what mistakes in position and things like that can induce as well. Um, so proper pulsar timing creates precisions that rival atomic clocks, which is really amazing. But it makes it, you know, it makes it obvious why this is a great choice for doing these kind of interferometry studies like we do in pulsar timing arrays. So we talk a lot about this noise budget. And so this is basically all the noise processes that are going on that are relevant to our pulsar timing. Um, and so you can see a similar diagram on the left to what we already saw, but it's showing you that the width that's circled there, that extremely tiny little blip, <laughs> um, is a thousand times the precision that we actually want to get for our, for our timing. So we, we need really great timing precision. We're going for less than a microsecond. Um, there are both white and red noise processes, some chromatic, some not, that kind of affect the pulsar timing. Um, some of these white noise, radiometer noise is a, a major one for sure. There's that intrinsic kind of pulse jitter, uh, shape changes between pulses that I already mentioned. And there are also these kind of long time period red noise processes. So. We have spin or timing noise, which is just kind of a little bit strange, but it is an intrinsic noise process to the pulsars that, that do kind of cause problems. Um, it's due to probably irregularities in the pulsar rotation, but that's a little bit unclear. Um, there's also dispersion by the interstellar medium, right? So there's this one over frequency squared effect uh, that's induced by the cold plasma that the light has to travel through. Um, and so de-dispersing the data, like you see in the middle diagram, uh, where the, um, you know, the low frequency light is going to be much more delayed, um, you have to de-disperse knowing the DM of the pulsar, the dispersion measure of the pulsar, so that you can get a very nice aligned signal and then do your integration to get that pulse profile. Um, we deal with these processes through different kinds of red and white noise parameters. So I'll talk a little bit about Nanograv and what we actually do, what we've been up to. Um, so it's the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. We've been doing this since about 2007. Uh, we are funded by the NSF as a physics frontier center. And all in all, we include more than 40 institutions. I think it's way more than that now, way more than 100 scientists. Tons of students are in Nanograv, and it's a really uh, kind of wonderful, vibrant collaboration. Um, we primarily use the Green Bank Telescope. The Very Large Array uh, and CHIME, Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. Um, but we also were very heavy users of Arecibo. Um, and so, yeah, GBT is absolutely near and dear to my heart. I'm, I'm a bit jealous of everyone who's able to be in Green Bank right, right now. It must be very, very lovely. Okay, so the IPTA is a consortium of all these consortia like nanograph. 
And so Nanograv is just the North American version, but then all of these different pulsar timing rate collaborations get together to produce, you know, to, to come together as the IPTA, the International Pulsar Timing Array. And so the kind of core members are the Europeans, um, the Indian Pulsar Timing Array and the Parks Pulsar Timing Array, in addition to Nanograv. We also have members with observing status, like the Meerkat PTA, which is based in South Africa, where Meerkat is, um, and the Chinese Pulsar Timing Array, which is able to use FAST to do some really incredible pulsar timing. timing. Um, and so altogether, our goal is basically to throw our data sets together. And in theory, this really should increase our sensitivity to gravitational waves significantly, right? Because we can see, you know, our colleagues can see pulsars in parts of the sky that we just can't. Um, they have beautiful instruments that have their own pros and cons. Um, and so it's really best to try to combine all of our data if we can. The problem is, that this is a very complicated process, both politically and scientifically. And so uh, data combination is definitely a hard task, but we are working currently on our third data release and it's going quite well. So that's been really, really exciting. So currently in Nanograv, um, after we lost Arecibo, uh, that you know Arecibo accounted for about half of our sensitivity and GBT was about the other half. Um, so the loss of Arecibo, we felt very profoundly. It was heartbreaking, as we all know, for uh, science, for Puerto Rico, for students, for so many people. Um, but we had to basically just pick up the pieces and say, what are we going to do now? We restructured the observing program. So now this is what it looks like. Monthly at the GBT, we have observations of almost 80 pulsars. And so 18 of those are looked at with both 820 megahertz receiver and L-band receiver. Um, 53 of them are only looked at with L-band, and that's because we were able to kind of push the low frequency part of the observing program to CHIME, which is the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. This is an awesome instrument in Canada. Um, it can see about 53 of nanograph's pulsars and has a bandwidth from 400 to 800 megahertz, and so it sort of takes care of that low end of the frequency spectrum. Um, all of those sources do overlap with the GBT source list. We had to take a few pulsars away from our observing program when we lost Arecibo. Uh, we are testing them for inclusion at the GBT for the most part. And you know we're doing what we can to, to kind of save the observing program. At the VLA, we use high frequency observations. So S-band observations from two to four gigahertz and get about 120 hours a year. So it's a much smaller part of our observing program. Uh, all but one of them, which is 0437, uh, overlap with the GBT source list. That source is not visible with the GBT. And so the VLA really helps us because that's an important pulsar timing source. Okay, so I'll step back really quickly and talk a little bit about recent results from Nanograv, but not the most recent results from Nanograv. So at the beginning of 2021, uh, we published the 12 and a half year data set. And so this included pulsar timing for 47 millisecond pulsars. Um, it was also the first time, and I'm not going to get too far into the weeds on this, but it's kind of interesting. Um, traditionally with pulsar timing, you are taking TOAs from different subbands, right? And so you have your whole bandwidth and then you split it into some number of subbands and you take a TOA from each of those bands. Um, and you also have sub integrations and you take TOAs from, you know, however you've split up your sub integrations. Um, but there is another method called wideband timing, which basically gets you a single measurement of, of the time of arrival and a single measurement of the DM. Um, and so this process is very cool because it lets you, you know, you are using a template to extract your time of arrival measurements that evolves with frequency, with radio observing frequency, because we know that pulse profiles actually do change quite a lot from one end of the band to the other. And so rather than just using a single template that represents the integrated data, we use a template that sort of shows the change in the shape of the pulse profile over the band. Um, and so using that template, we call it a portrait instead of just a template, uh, we can get out a much smaller data set because we're only extracting a single TOA. Um, and so for the 12 and a half year data set, this actually reduced our data volume by a factor of 33. Um, and analysis of this data set 
resulted in the detection of a common red noise process. So this is a, you know, a noise process that's seen in each of our pulsars with the same spectrum, but that doesn't have spatial correlations. And so this is kind of exactly what you expect on the road uh, to detecting gravitational waves, uh, but the spatial correlations are uh, not there yet in this case. And I see that we are running out of time a little bit, so I'll try to hurry up, I apologize. Um, so the 15 year data set, uh, the most recent one that we published, contains 68 millisecond pulsars, which was a giant leap from the 12 and a half year data set. Um, it included three-ish more years of data. Um, you can see each successive data release in this plot, like the five year contained 17 millisecond pulsars, and then each one grew uh, either, I mean, always adding more data in time, but also sometimes adding more pulsars as well. Um, we produced both an narrow band and a wide band data set for all uh, 68 of these millisecond pulsars. Um, we're using new timing software that I'll talk about in a second. Um, it contains about 16 years of data, even though it's called the 15 year data set. So <laughs> that's caused some confusion, understandably. Um, we have VLA data for the first time in the data release, which is very cool. Um, and we decided to cut off the data set for uh, Aristibo, obviously, after the first cable break happened and we were no longer able to observe. So that was a bit of a forced cut. Um, but then at the GBT, the pulsar timing back end, Guppy, actually uh, was retired during this data set. And so that's what we chose at the endpoint of, of the GBT data set. Okay. So I'll talk very quickly about what we've been up to in terms of this pulsar timing pipeline. So there are a couple of kind of very classic pulsar timing software packages, um, Tempo and Tempo2. And so quite a few years ago now, um, some folks started developing PINT. PINT is a, a acronym for PINT is not Tempo3. Um, so it's saying it's not just built on those previous timing packages. You can go check it out on GitHub if you'd like. Uh, there's some really nice tutorials and stuff. Um, but basically, we need a pipeline because our goal is to time as many pulsars as we can. Uh, the, the sensitivity to the gravitational wave background is directly proportional to the number of pulsars that we time. Uh, so it's the most important factor. The other things that matter are how long we've been observing uh, and how good our timing precision is. Um, we want eventually to time 200 millisecond pulsars, but we currently only time about 80 of them. Um, so there are new sort of techniques and instruments and data combination activities going on uh, that are totally reliant on pint and on wideband timing, like I mentioned, those much smaller data sets. Um, we were really committed while we were developing this pint pal time uh, pipeline, which is based on pint, um, to, you know, we wanted to make it as transparent as possible. We knew that there were going to be a lot of eyes on this data set. Um, we wanted to make it accessible to everyone, to the public, to scientists, to students. Um, and so you can go check it out. We are still making improvements, but because the new data release is public, uh, you can use it with this PintPal pipeline if you're interested in playing with it. So there's the GitHub link for that. Okay, so in these last few minutes, I'll talk about some of the main science results. And I apologize, I'm gonna green through these because there were a lot of papers, which is fantastic, um, but it's a bit of a, barrage of information. So uh, the first one I'll talk about is the one I was most involved with, which is the Nanograv 15 year data set observations and timing of 68 millisecond pulsars. This is our pulsar timing data set paper. Um, so one of the things we did as part of this paper is measure the masses of as many of the pulsars as we could. So when a pulsar is in a binary, sometimes under very special circum circumstances, you can do more than just put a limit on, on the mass of the pulsar in the companion. Um, if there are certain general relativistic effects at play, and specifically the one we're talking about here is Shapiro delay. So this is what happens when a pulsar you know, goes behind its companion along our line of sight, um, and the companion uh, is deforming space-time and delaying the pulses such that we see um, a very large spike in the timing residual right at superior conjunction. And so getting a measurement of that spike lets us actually disentangle the mass of the pulsar and the mass of the companion, which is great. 
Uh, so in these very limited cases where you do see post-capillarian phenomena happening in the binaries, you can get a nice constraint on the mask. Um, so there was a lot of interest in this source called J0740 plus 6620. This was a project I led a few years ago, um, along with other colleagues and Nanograv colleagues um, that basically used the Nanograv data set for this source, which was about five years long at the time, plus some targeted observations with the GBT over superior conjunction to really constrain the shape of that, of that spike as well, as well as we could and get a solid mass measurement for the pulsar because we had seen at first after just analyzing the nanograv data that it looked like the mass of that source was quite high. Um, and so we wanted to do those supplemental campaigns with GBT. We did, we combined all these data and we published uh, that the mass was 2.14 plus or minus 0.09 solar masses or 0.1 solar masses, um, which it was at the time the most massive neutron star ever observed. Um, by this technique, it still is. There's a bit, there have been other studies and things that, that it gets a bit complicated. Um, but this is really exciting, right? Because if we see very, very massive neutron stars, it tells us a, something about the neutron star equation of state, which is basically the way super dense material uh, behaves in the inside of neutron stars. Um, so we saw some small changes. Uh, we kind of encourage people to look at other works for a better mass measurement for 0740. 1614 minus 2230 was sort of the first of these two solar mass neutron stars, right? I and mean, the can canonical neutron star had a mass of like 1.4 solar masses. Um, but this 1614 source in 2010 was the first time we could confidently say that we've seen like a two solar mass neutron star. And so we do continue to monitor that source as part of Nanograv. Um, its mass actually increased slightly uh, after this data release, possibly because we changed the timing model a little bit, and we've now been observing it long enough to detect some red noise. Um, there are some other exciting sources with possibly high masses um, that we actually had a follow-up campaign at the GBT for, I think it was five sources, um, five of those kind of borderline sources that have high masses, but the error bars on the mass measurement are pretty poor. Um, we observed those uh, during supplemental campaigns, the GBT, and so we are, uh, you know, going to incorporate that into the next data release. We also do astrometry measurements and all kinds of sort of supplementary science stuff as part of this data release. Okay, so I won't talk about noise budget too much, um, but there is a really, really nice paper for those of you who are interested. Um, the detector characteriz characterization noise budget is an amazing kind of overview of how uh, our accounting for noise processes works. Um, they did some really great things looking at the total amount of red noise in all the sources. Um, they kind of proved that the use of the red noise model is justified and that, uh, you know, just doing this accounting properly is extremely important. But I won't dwell on this because it's a little bit in the weeds. Um, the kind of headline paper was evidence for gravitational wave background. And so this is basically a paper that shows that not only are we seeing uh, even stronger evidence for a common red noise process in the pulsars, but we're also seeing the spatial correlations that we expect to see for the Hellings and Downs curve. And so you can see how uh, you know our data are kind of following are following this Hellings and Downs curve quite well now. I should have included the past results, but they, you know, did not show any obvious correlation. Um, and so, depending on how you're doing the analysis, we think there's about a one in ten thousand chance of of this being due to anything else. So we're pretty confident in our results, even though they don't. You know, we're more in the three to four sigma regime instead of the gold standard five sigma, sigma regime. And that's why we call it evidence, not a detection. Um, but we were really excited about this result. So this was fairly neat. Um, and so there were 67 uh, pulsars in the data set. They weren't able to observe, uh, use one in the analysis because it hadn't been observed long enough. Um, the time span is 16 years. Uh, as I said, that common process gains, gains bigger significance, and we have compelling evidence uh, for the Hellings and Downs correlations. Um, people ask a really good question, which is just, how do you know you're not wrong? And there are a few ways to answer this. One of them is that recreating that Hellings and Downs quadrupolar correlation is really, really hard. 
So there are processes like clock errors that are telescopes that would induce monopoles. There are things like errors in solar system ephemerides that can, uh, you know, induce dipoles um, in, in the signal. But this is a very characteristic signal. And also the really exciting thing, oh, sorry, I don't have it here, but the exciting thing is that our colleagues in the International Pulsar Timing Array are also seeing a similar signal for the most part. So everyone's in agreement. Um, we have sort of the highest significance, but everyone's results are kind of being the same thing. We do think that we're seeing spatial correlations. So this is very exciting. Um, so what does this actually mean about astrophysics? Um, the 15 year results are kind of interesting because they're still consistent with lots of models for supermassive binary black hole evolution. Um, so sort of it's, it's in line with the signal we expect if the signals due to these black hole binary mergers. Um, but we can't say that it's definitely all from supermassive binary black holes. We're not at that point yet, which, which leaves room for some interesting interpretations as well. Um, you know, the gravitational wave amplitude that we're seeing is a lot higher than we expected from a lot of models. And so we think that mergers of these supermassive binary black holes might be more frequent or they might have more massive components. Um, and so it's really only more observing that's going to help us uh, figure out for sure what, what the signal is actually coming from and explore more about the nature of these binaries because characterizing the whole gravitational wave spectrum in our you know, band of sensitivity is what we have to do to really get the most astrophysics information out of it. Um, I'm not going to get too much into this. I will say, um, you know, the signal is dominated by the most massive uh, and high mass ratios with different masses in spirals. Um, typical redshifts are probably from about 0.15 to 0.9. Um, and the separations are between 0.1 and 0.01 parsecs. And so basically, because we're seeing the signal, the we know that the binaries aren't just getting to a certain distance and stalling, right? There are other processes going on, there are interactions going on that are helping these binary black holes to finally merge in the end. Okay, and then I, this is very close to the end, I apologize. Um, so there's some new physics predictions as well. Um, because we're not 100% sure that the signal is definitely coming just from supermassive binary black holes, um, there are actually things before the kind of cementing of the cosmic micro microwave background variation that could have happened uh, to kind of uh, impart a signal, a, a primordial gravitational wave signal on the universe, right? And so um, there are things like inflationary signals, um, phase transitions, uh, cosmic strings, domain walls, all kinds of exciting exotic things. And there are actually several of these proposals that are consistent with the signal that we're seeing. And so the door is really open. You know, we can't say anything one way or another about the, the cause of the gravitational wave signal that we see, but a lot of these theories are still sort of in play. And that's very cool. Um, once we start, uh, or once we continue to observe, we're going to have more sensitivity to anisotropy in the background. So instead of assuming that it's just a stochastic gravitational wave background, we actually, if it's coming from supermassive black hole binary in spirals, we expect there to be a fair amount of unevenness in the signal. Um, and so that kind of spatial information will help us discern the source. Um, we didn't see any uh, continuous wave signals that were kind of compelling yet, um, and they were able to put an upper limit on the continuous wave amplitude. Okay, we're doing IPTA data combination. It's going on very well. It's really complicated, but we're really excited. And so over the next couple of years, we're gonna be finalizing this data set, doing analysis and seeing uh, exactly what we can kind of discover from this vastly improved combined data set. Uh, which should get us a lot more sensitivity. It's super cool. Okay, so briefly, we're really excited about integrating the CHIME data into our data set. The Green Bank Telescope Ultra Wideband Receiver, which I, I'm guessing has been mentioned, um, is going to be really exciting for us. This will cover 0 0.7 to 4 gigahertz. Um, and so that increase in bandwidth should just about, you know, maybe double our timing precision. Um, we're also moving to wideband-only timing. Uh, we have IPTA DR3. 
Um, we are always evaluating new pulsars and seeing if we can add more and more pulsars to the timing array. But in the further future, we're really excited about this DSE 2000 project. So this is a 2000 element interferometer, five meter dishes. Um, Nanograv is uh, slated to get about 25% of all on sky time. This is mainly a survey telescope that's going to discover billions of sources. It's going to be really incredible. Um, it's also going to do some electromagnetic follow up or you know, be able to kind of uh, synthesize with projects that are doing all, all kinds of gravitational wave work. Um, the sky survey is going to be absolutely amazing, but it's going to get us something like Arecibo sensitivity. Um, and have a lot of great synergies with other projects as well. And so we're excited about the possibility of the DSA 2000 moving forward. Um, we're also obviously extremely excited about the NGVLA, um, the SKA. Meerkat is doing absolutely amazing pulsar timing ar array work. Um, and there are lots of other instruments that are just awesome. So it's a pretty exciting time. Um, and I'll leave my slides up. Thank you so much. Thank you. A wonderful presentation. Um, let's start with online participants first. Uh, if you have any questions, um, we have about uh, uh, six or seven minutes left in this time slot. So anything from online folks, uh, you can either uh, put it in chat and <clears throat> that'll be read here or you can speak up. Jay, if I make, uh, may I ask a question, please? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, essentially, uh, two questions. In the one of the first slides was the comparison between the different instruments that detect gravitational waves, and um, there was a unit which was called characteristic strain. Can that be um, interpreted as the amount by which space time gets expanded or compressed, which also would mean that the order of magnitude. Uh, which is detected by Nanograph and the other uh, experiments is much, much smaller than what we see with LIGO. Yes. Uh, so the you are right about how to interpret that number. Um, the strain that Nanograph sen is sensitive to is a much larger deformation than what LIGO is sensitive to, just because the source of our, um, our we expand uh, much further up that scale. Um, and it's because our sources are these supermassive black hole binaries rather than smaller in spirals. But yeah, you're totally right about the interpretation. Thank you. Um, I have a question uh, about uh, timing and stuff. It, it's more uh, detail oriented. Uh, do you time the uh, the the things based on other pulse, pulsar type uh, uh, signals, or do you uh, use uh, uh, like uh, Nash, uh, NIST time, or do you use, uh, what, where's your time source? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, it varies from observatory to observatory a little bit, but it is not based on other pulsars. It's based on um, some observatories have direct GPS, um, some we have to do a conversion through NIST, it, but yeah, it's, it's the latter. So I have a question about um, the, it seems like to me in the folding process, you're like losing some of your resolution. So that's where Arecibo or the, the more sensitive telescopes come in, I guess, right? Because you can look at signals with less folding. Is that right? Wait, sorry. I don't think I quite understand. Is there a, are you referring to a plot or? No, to the folding process that you're using to develop the pulsar, you, uh, signal. It seems like you lose some of your resolution because you have to integrate over folding. Right. Yeah, but that's the only, so for millisecond pulsars, the only way to even see the pulse profile is by folding, you know, thousands of those pulses, those individual pulses. They, they literally can't be discerned from noise um, otherwise. And so, you know, and then no matter what, you're going to be doing this process of folding for known pulsars, right? But the timing precision that you get out of that is going to be very based on the instrument that you're using. So instruments with much larger bandwidth um, are going to give you better timing precision. Uh, you're going to have variations based on the shape of the, you know, the intrinsic pulse itself. Um, but the folding process is 
very necessary for, for millisecond pulsar observations, no matter what. And then how much impact will, will uh, uh, expected gravitational wave make on the signal? Is it a large impact or like you mentioned the 65 nanohertz uh, period, I believe. Oh. Is that of the gravitational wave or of the change in the pulsing rate of the pulsar? No, sorry. So the, the nanohertz signal is the frequency of the gravitational wave signal that we're sensitive to. Um, when it comes to the effect on any single pulsar, that's going to be extraordinarily small. That's like dwarfed by, uh, you know, other noise processes that, that are more relevant. But it's only because we have this network of pulsars that have different spatial correlations that we can actually see uh, that, that correlated signal. So these are pretty small timing deviations, but over a long period of time for a large number of pulsars, uh, we're able to kind of bring that gravitational wave signal out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a software question. I appreciate Nanograv making all the data and tools available. I just wonder, is, is Enterprise still the Bayesian inference engine in your pipeline? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. There are groups doing uh, using other software packages um, to, to do their analysis, but within Nanograv, um, most of it is done through Enterprise. Yeah. All right, um, yeah, of course. And all of that, you know, for those of you who are interested in the software aspect of things, all of that, I think, falls um, under the Nanograv umbrella. So it's on the Nanograv GitHub page. You can see what, what we've been developing the most and things like that. Okay, can you hear me? I sure can, okay. yeah. Okay, this is kind of a side question, but um, back on the slide that said uh, noise budget, uh, you had a graph on there that I really loved. And uh, uh, a little further, let's see, where was it? There, yes. This one? Yeah. Uh, what app did you use to make that graph? <laughs> Which one? Uh, the one on the left with the um the many traces on it oh this plot um i so i didn't make that plot this is from a paper by michael lamb who's another uh nanograv guy um i imagine so there are some sort of basic software packages that we use for pulsar timing and pulsar analysis um ps archive is one of them i imagine that this is ps archive based um, but maybe kind of a homebrew plotting uh, script. I'm not sure if you're if you are um, interested, definitely um, talk to Michael Lamb. So his email is going to be on any of the nanograph papers, and I'm sure he'd be happy to. Michael Lamb, L A M B. Is that what? Uh, just L A M. Yeah. L A M. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else have any questions for thankful? I've I've got one. I've been requested to talk a little bit more about SETI for uh, our group. So uh, the uh, so my question is more science, a little science fiction-ish, but uh, the Albuquerque warp drive that the Mexican uh, uh, scientist came up with that said there's a the theoretical way to make a warp drive, just like Star Trek, but it's, it's actually based on Einstein field equations, um, is if, the, the other thought process was that it's possible that the pointing array might be able to pick up if there was a warp drive civilization out there that was bending space time, it would look something like a, uh, a gravitational wave front at a certain frequency. Is any of your, I think your graduate students ought to be young enough to figure out that there, there it, it is a way to look at that and see if you can use your pointing array to figure out if there's a civilization using warp drive. Based so on I am, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, that's very interesting. My intuition would be that a signal like that 
would not be in the in the pulsar timing array band in that very low frequency regime, right? Because we're sensitive to signals where the process that's creating them is happening over very long time spans, right? That's that's kind of why we had to observe for 15 years to even be able to claim evidence of a signal. Um, so these are very long time scale process events and also ones coming from very massive sources. Um, and so I think that in terms of like techno signatures or, or you know, interesting things like this, and I don't know the details um, at, at all, but my guess would be that that would be a, in a much higher frequency kind of band. I, I think it's a great dissertation project for one of your grad students uh, if he looks that up and it's a good SETI question. Someone's going to ask you that in the future anyway. So it's good I love to it. have yeah. the answer. That's okay. great. Any other questions? All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thankful. Great. Thank job. you all for having me. Have a great week.